In August of 1953, Captain who pelted Project Blue Book asked to be reassigned when his staff was reduced from 10 to 2. While the program still existed, its credibility was soon called into question. By August of 1963, when Major Hector Quintanilla took over the reins, he and his staff were clearly touting the party line by debunking virtually every sighting, no matter how credible. At one point, physicist James E. McDonald publicly stated that Major Quintanilla was neither scientifically competent nor should he be held accountable for his opinions since he was clearly following orders passed on to him by his superiors. Dr. McDonald wasn't the only scientist to hold Blue Book in contempt. Others pointed out that Blue Book personnel were performing research of questionable merit or were flatly perpetuating a blatant cover-up. Take, for example, the UFO flap from the Midwest and southeastern United States in the summer of 1965. Witnesses in Texas reported multicolored lights and large aerial objects shaped like eggs or diamonds. The Oklahoma Highway Patrol reported seeing up to four UFOs simultaneously. Additionally, John Shockley, a meteorologist from Wichita, Kansas, reported he was able to use the State Weather Bureau radar track a number of odd aerial objects flying in altitudes between 6,000 and 9,000 feet. These and other reports received wide publicity. Project Blue Book officially determined the witnesses had mistaken Jupiter or bright stars such as Rigel or Betelgeuse for something else. What made the Air Force's claim ludicrous was the fact that Jupiter, Rigel, and Betelgeuse were not even visible in the night sky in Oklahoma at that time of the year. This obvious blunder caused one UFO researcher to point out that the Air Force must have had its Starfinder upside down. Another highly publicized 1966 mass sighting in Ohio, police officers from three different jurisdictions not only sighted a disc-shaped silvery object that came as low as 50 feet above the ground, but the cops actually gave chase. Less than a week later, after having interviewed only one of the officers who witnessed the UFO, Major Quintanilla concluded that the officer had chased a communication satellite. This conclusion was so poorly received that it caused Ohio Congressman Bill Stanton to announce, the Air Force has suffered a great loss of prestige in this community. Once people entrusted with the public welfare no longer think the people can handle the truth, then the people will no longer trust the government. Despite the public tongue lashing from a sitting congressman, the beat went on at Blue Book for another three years. Criticism of Blue Book became so pronounced that in September 1968, Colonel Ray Sleeper of the Air Force's Foreign Technology Division officially asked J. Allen Hynek for advice on improving the project's scientific protocols. Hynek responded with a list of eight recommendations, including broadening their staff, revamping their analysis methodology, liaising with the scientific community, and concentrating on only a handful of the best cases per month as opposed to trying to investigate the 70 cases they were averaging. Despite being provided with clear instructions that would have improved the results as well as their perception to the public, none of Hynek's suggestions was acted upon. This was hardly the only congressional interest that UFOs drew at the time. The same year, a hearing on the matter was convened by the House Armed Services Committee after a cluster of sightings was reported in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Following this hearing, the Conning Committee was formed. Like the Robertson panel, the Condon Committee was composed of civilian scientists and technical experts. The difference with the committee was that it was scheduled to last for a year as opposed to what amounted to an extended weekend for its predecessor. Aside from physicist Edward Condon, who chaired the group, there was also physicist James E. MacDonald, physicist Frederick Ayer, astronomer William Hartman, electrical engineer Norman Levine, chemist Roy Craig, psychologists Michael Wertheimer, Dan Culbertson, and James Wadsworth, as well as a gaggle of other scientists, technical experts, consultants, and grad students that served on a part-time basis. Funded by the Air Force, the University of Colorado, where Condon was a member of the faculty, agreed to host a study starting on October 6, 1966. One month later, retired Marine Corps Major Donald Kehoe himself a former naval aviator, as well as a renowned UFO researcher, agreed to share his files with the committee. In 1956, Kehoe co-founded NICAP, 
one of the most respected civilian UFO reporting agencies of the era. He also agreed to share his expertise in helping the committee collect, investigate, and analyze the reports they would undoubtedly receive during the year. What should have been a dream team of scientific luminaries and UFO experts quickly devolved into bureaucratic bungling within the committee. It didn't help that two months after forming the committee, his chairman Ed Condon stated in a public lecture that the government shouldn't study the UFO phenomenon because he felt the subject was nonsense. The situation got so bad that one NICAP member actually resigned in protest and a committee member confronted Condon to express his concern that the chairman's revelation would create a firestorm of negative publicity. Another committee member, physicist James E. McDonald, who himself came to believe in the validity of many of the sightings the committee had been shown, was shocked to learn another committee member had written a memo in July to university administrators reassuring them that they could expect the study to demonstrate that the UFO sightings had no basis in reality. Regardless of the controversy, other journalists as well as members of several UFO reporting agencies continued to forward sightings to the committee. Soon the media got wind of the memo, which was then printed in its entirety. After that, two committee members reported in an interview that they felt Condon's method were anything but scientific. They were both soon fired after the interview was publicized in scientific research. The threats of suits and countersuits did nothing to enhance the committee's public image. Nor did the main 1968 issue of Look Magazine that described the Condon Committee as a half million dollar trick. After the release of the Look article, Indiana Representative J. Edward Roush stated, the article raised grave doubts about the scientific profundity and objectivity of the project. Of course, that didn't stop the committee from publishing a 989-page report in January 1969. As the United States drew within seven months of landing a man on the moon, the opinion of the committee was that Nothing has come from the study of UFOs in the past 21 years that has added to scientific knowledge. Surprisingly, Condon also concluded that government agencies and private foundations ought to be willing to consider UFO research proposal on an open-minded, unprejudiced basis. Go figure. You'll note that the committee's conclusion didn't say that UFOs weren't real. In fact, of the 56 case studies investigated during the committee's tenure, the official conclusion was that the probability that at least one genuine UFO was involved appears to be fairly high. Even though Condon had gone out of his way to try to nullify the committee's findings before the report had been issued, fully 30% of the cases studied were still left without any plausible explanation. During the 60s and 70s, both the U.S. and the USSR routinely sent space probes to other planets, as well as beginning to send men and women into space. On several manned missions, Astronauts and cosmonauts reported seeing unidentified objects. I'll cover this in my next webisode entitled, UFOs and the Space Race. If you like what you've seen, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell.